Welcome everyone to this next interview for Flambeau Noir, the International Left Hand Path Conference. Um, today we have with us um, by telephone the uh, great uh, Ipsissimus Don Webb, um, who has been around in the uh, occult scene and the left hand path for quite a long time. Um, so without further ado, hi Don. Hello. Could you uh, quickly just give us a quick little um, introduction about yourself and uh, kind of what you do um, in this uh, community? Well, for many years, um, I've been a writer. I've been, a, of course, a science fiction and horror writer mainly. Uh, 30, uh, 28 years ago, 29 years ago, uh, I joined the Temple of Set. I uh, served as their high priest for six years from... 1996 to 2002, and I've written, um, so far, five books on, well, I've had five books published on occult topics. I'm working on three more right now, uh, and as a consequence, since I was one of the first people to sort of write in the post-satanic milieu, um, a lot of people... I have been their introduction, particularly my book, Uncle Set Knox, The Central Guide to the Left-Hand Path, um, seems to have you know, sold pretty well and gotten a lot of attention. Right, yes, and actually <laughs> my first question is a bit uh, about that uh, book, um, which is a book that uh, I've read uh, a few times and I enjoy it a lot. Um, so in there you kind of define you give a guide um, so can you kind of describe would would you say that some of those are the defining features of the left-hand path or what is the left-hand path for you well the the, the first of all, let's talk a little bit about that term left-hand path um, that came into English uh, as a um, more as kind of a novelistic idea uh, Victorian kind of like that to refer to whoever the bad guys were, as where the light workers were on the side of good, um, and then Bulwer Lytton wanted to have an, an evil sorcerer, and so therefore he developed the term left hand path. Now the term itself had been floating around India for a long time, Vama Marg, the path of the left, um, also usually more accurately, the path of the woman, the path of the feminine. Um, but it was wonderful to have somebody to really, really hate. Uh, early on in the English-speaking world, um, most occultists defined themselves as not being left-hand path. Whatever they didn't like, they gave that label, oh, that's the, you know, the left-hand path, the brothers of darkness, the black brothers, the evil lodge. Etc. It's all very you know good and wonderful to assume that you're on sort of the morally superior ground. Then um, in the 1960s, Anton LaVey immediately seized this idea because he understood the power of the outsider and says, "Man, if I label myself as the outsider, people will pay attention to me." Think about how extraordinarily successful he was. The Church of Satan, which was not, despite what the Christians tell us, a huge organization with thousands of members, was able to do things like get Look Magazine to do a spread on it. He was invited as a guest on The Tonight Show. He was made a technical director of movies. Suddenly, all kinds of attention. But I don't think, in LeVay's case, he was particularly systematic in figuring out what did it mean. Uh, a good friend of mine, my own initiator, um, Dr. Stephen Flowers, early on decided to look at the roots of this term. You know, what the term actually ultimately means is union. It's the idea that through certain spiritual, magical, political practices, persons can develop a degree of substance in themselves to become immortal, immortal in the sense of not only surviving death, but surviving death in the sense that you are potent, powerful essence. And if this is true as an idea religiously, 
That would even mean that during your lifetime, you should experience some of this power. Um, the left-hand path is a path that says, I don't want to join God. doesn't mean you hate the divine. Almost every left-hand path tradition has some notion of the divine that's in some way attractive. It just means I don't want to give up individuality. And so early on, my thoughts were, how do we systemize this? Um, the Temple of Set had the general notion that, hey, individuality is good, individuality is to be prized, individuality is the spiritual goal, but it was not necessarily systemic. My own ideas were thinking, how do I make this systemic, but not make it prescriptive? In other words, I can't tell somebody, you've got to do this, but I can say, well, given these 20, 30, 40 practices, some of these will give you better results. Here's how you can test them out. So what I wanted to do with the essential guide was just start saying to people, yes, this idea exists. It's been around for a while. It's easily workable by you, and you do not have to follow me, but here's the experiments you might want to try. Right, yeah. Um, and so that kind of uh, brings us far forward <laughs> to kind of uh, your latest book, Uncle Setnak's Night Book, um, which I I, I ha personally haven't uh, read it yet. But um, is that kind of um, a bit more of a, a part two in a way? The Night Book. Uh became is in some ways um, more personal. In some ways, the night book, I share some of my own experiences uh, as well as um, listing some techniques that have become useful over the years. The, um, yeah. the nice thing about a group that's organized, like the Temple of Set, a database, so it's not just a personal, hey, this worked for me. So I can look at that and say, well, this worked pretty good for 20 or 30 people, or, hey, we tried that, didn't work so well. Mm -hmm. Probably the most personal part of the night book is I did uh, share some of my own interactions with Seth. Now, okay. the reason I waited till late in my career to talk about that is that's not, that should not be the basis of convincing anyone. I mean, I can go down to... Uh, the parking lot next to the grocery store that I shop at, and I can find somebody that's talked to God. That's not, right. a, that's not a common thing for people. Mm -hmm. So I wanted there to be a fairly significant body of work before I said, and yes, you can have a personal interaction. They are rare, but you should judge by the effect on the person, not on the claims of the interaction. Right. So would you say that that was um, sort of... Um the, one of the needs behind that, behind writing night book, um, to kind that, of well, it, that that was one of the the needs for the night book. Mm -hmm. The um, one of the other needs is I had uh, a vast collection of articles that had appeared in small magazines that um, ultimately have ceased to be, and I had people write me over the years saying, hey. That thing you wrote in the black flag 25 years ago, do you have a copy? Uh, and I realized, hey, if someone is still thinking about this, maybe I should collect some of these things together. Um, since serious occultism tends to appeal to the very few, one of the big problems is it means it's often tied up with journals that disappear, you know, that had a very limited circulation to start right. with. And if you don't decide, well, I'm going to make a record, then the record vanishes. Right. It's always uh, sort of by happenstance <laughs> um, that you think to, oh, I should keep this. <laughs> I don't know if I won't have it uh, 20 years down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, and that brings us to the next question then. Um, on, on this journey that you've gone through, um, which has been a long part of your life, can you can you tell us uh, one or two things that kind of stood out as major realizations? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I would say is a huge realization is uh, the left-hand path is process-oriented. You don't start off with a clear idea. You start off with a clear want, with a desire, with a need, and you have to test your idea. Oftentimes you can start off with an idea and think, oh, I don't even like this. This makes me uncomfortable. I have to look at this to then see, well, why does it make you uncomfortable? What part of yourself is it speaking to? Um, and to persist in the path is that you, you must be temperamentally set up to say, hey, I am willing to be surprised. I'm willing to have my mind changed. I would rather have an accurate perception than have comfortable prejudices. And so, you know, again and again, I'll encounter something that, at first, I might have thought, that's completely wrong. That's a totally wacky notion. And yet, with time, by giving sincere thought to resolve, my notions change. Happy by being myself. I am the source of overcoming, rather than being the uh, partisan for any ideas that I have. I can tell you um, how I joined okay. uh, the Temple of Set because I think that's very illustrative. Okay, sure. Uh, back in 19, let me think when this was, 1988, um, there was this, never, never got finished, but this, this uh, writer I knew wanted to put together a collection of short stories about the Salem Witch Trials. So he wrote to a few of us and said, hey, if you'll write a story about this, I'm going to bring out a book, 1992. It's going to be the 300th anniversary of the trials. I think there'll be a lot of press about it. This is kind of a fun thing to, to play with. And since I wanted to be in that book, uh, I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. I'm glad to put in a story. I'm, a, I'm an expert on the Salem Witch Trials, <laughs> meaning, of course, I didn't know a damn thing about them, <laughs> but I'm a really quick study. Right. I went to the library. I checked out some books. I read about the trials, um, and I wrote up a chart for my own convenience about the, the steps, how the trials started, how the hysteria grew, what stopped them. Mm -hmm. I charted out a timeline. I did this on a big piece of yellow legal pad paper. Uh, and I remember one night I was finished. I was tired. I was like, hey, I'm ready now. I've got my research done. And about that time, in another room of my apartment, someone was watching the Geraldo Rivera Satanism in America special. <laughs> it was very exciting stuff. It had this big swirling baphomet that came out, and there was noise, and there were all these experts on Satanism. Right. Now, I had not considered the satanic panic, not really given any thought to that as an ongoing cultural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I went out, and then they had four or five experts sitting to one side of Geraldo, and then on the other side, they had Zena and Dr. Aquino. I had no idea who these people were. Talking, and I realized, oh, that's Anton LaVey's daughter. You know, I was at least culturally aware enough to be aware of the Church of Satan. Right. And as far as Aquino, man, this is a weird-looking guy with funny eyebrows. <laughs> I have no idea who he is. Uh, and these experts start talking about satanic crime. Well, I picked up my chart that I had just spent the afternoon developing. Yeah. Sure enough, every single thing that went into uh, the Salem Witch Trials was showing up in America. The hysteria, the focus that somehow our children are being targeted, the use of evidence that is completely spectral. You know, one of the uh, investigators was even talking about the use of dreams as evidence. Right. And I'm thinking, wow, America has not changed in 300 years. <laughs> then this one investigator, really obese man, it's like Jabba the Hutt, 
began this long spiel of, I've got the evidence. I just don't know how much blood they've used in their, their rituals. It's terrifying. I know the dresses of most of the great satanic criminals in America. And this Aquino guy said right then, the logical thing that every sane person was thinking, well, why don't you arrest them then? And I heard his mic being shut off. I heard the click, and I've been around sound systems enough to know, yeah. you know, that Geraldo or his, probably his line producer, shut this guy off. <laughs> then immediately they cut to commercial. And I thought, that was the one possible sane moment in this whole thing. Yeah, the one bit of truth. <laughs> um, well, it so happened that later, the next night, I was at my Dungeons and Dragons role-playing group. Yes, D&D did lead me to Satanism. <laughs> I was sitting there, and I started going off on the fact that, you know, did anybody see this show? This one guy said this really smart thing. I wish I knew the letter. And one member of my group kept giving me this kind of death stare every time I would talk. And I thought, oh, my God, she must be offended. Clearly she's bought into the the bullshit, I should probably shut up. <laughs> so as we were leaving and walking out to our cars, she walked over to me and said, do you really want to send Dr. Aquino a fan letter? And I noticed that was odd because Geraldo had never referred to him as Dr. Aquino. And I said, well, yeah. And she said, well, I'll be seeing him in Toronto next week. I could give it to him. <laughs> this was a shattering moment. Because this was the first time I had ever met an occultist who was not, in fact, in some way certifiable. <laughs> you know, she did not live, live at home, you know, in her parents' basement. Mm -hmm. She didn't spend all her time talking about esoteric topics. Esoteric all my life, but long ago, I had learned not to talk about it, not for fear of oppression, but for fear of looking like a complete flaming idiot. And so I said, well, uh, yeah, of course. I went home and wrote a letter. And in the letter, I talked about the fact that, wow, that was a really clear and useful thing you said. And I'm sorry to see that America is going down the same path it went down before. And then I ended with this remark saying, I don't understand what your group's about. I said, it claims to be about individual self-development and self-deification. I said, why in the world would you need a group for that? Isn't that exactly the wrong idea? And I sent that off. Right. My friend delivered it. Mainly I did this because I didn't want any contact with these people. Because at my heart, I thoroughly believed if you were an occultist, well, basically a well-adjusted human being. Mm -hmm. Well, sure enough, he wrote me back. It was a very cordial letter. And at the very end, he said, as far as the notion of groups helping with individuality, we've never figured this out. Maybe you should join and explain it to us. Um, <clears throat> and I like the fact that, you know, the guy could, could respond with good humor. Mm -hmm. Again, not what I was expecting. And uh, anyway, seven years after that, I was the high priest. Um, because I looked at this one thing and I said, hey, everything society tells me suggests this is not the way to go. I have, I think, a gut-level feeling this is not the way to go. And yet, where does this idea come from? So I did two things. One, I researched the Temple of Set as thoroughly as I could, which in those days was not very thoroughly. And two, meaning there wasn't a lot of public material out yeah. about them. And two, I researched in myself what bothers me about the idea of a group. Is it, is, am, I, am I afraid of cult behavior? I'm afraid we'll all go and dress the same way and chant and I'll spend all my money here. And I decided, hmm, this is worth an investigation. I mean, 
what a great thing for your byline as a horror writer. And I once actually joined a satanic cult. <laughs> so I joined. And surprisingly, having walked in without the idea that this was going to save my life, to use a conventional phrase, yeah. found that exactly the things I was looking for were here. And what wasn't here, most importantly, I could invent. It gave me a platform. Now, that was something that I totally would not have expected. Uh, I'm not a joiner of organizations. I, you know, unlike a lot of people in the cult who, when they start talking about what groups they're in, can list 16 things, 20 things they've been members of. Uh, I am very shy. I don't manifest a satanic aesthetic. Uh, I'm always easy to spot at conclaves because most people are wearing black and I'm the guy there on the Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> but I learned the value of challenging prejudices when you discover it's not a prejudice that you have, it's a prejudice that someone has taught you. This is a major fetter. If someone has taught you not to like someone, something, or someone, you have to ask yourself, why did they teach me that? Mm -hmm. Does this fetter serve me in some way? So this was a major thing, way to change things. Uh, that would be a huge thing that stood out for me in the past. Yeah. Another thing that stood out for me in the past was how useful it is to work with people that are either slightly beyond where I am or not quite at my level of development. You get much more mileage, not by saying, okay, I'm going to take this book and it was written by Crowley or whatever and try to bowder my head against this because he's writing from a level that I'm not at right now. Mm -hmm. But it's different if you meet someone a face-to-face -face human being, you can see their home, you can look at their life and hear what they're struggling with. That was a huge impetus that I would not have expected because up to then, up to my joining, I was kind of a, you know, a bookish guy. I mean, I had friends and so forth, but my intellectual development was really keyed into what I read as opposed to what I did. Well, those would be really major things along the way. Yeah. Uh, that's good. I, I like those points. They're, uh, they're, they resonate a lot with me. <laughs> um, um, is, so kind of coming back with um, the um, seeing sort of the similarities of uh, the witch trials and stuff. Um, what what could you say that, um, like, what do you think evil is, and why is it so present or prevalent in society and religions? Why, why does it seem that everyone pushes that so much, um, even though they're presenting themselves to be good? Well, good and evil have two really different definitions in our civilization, and unfortunately we confuse these definitions a lot, and so this does not help us to, to think our way out of this. Mm -hmm. Good and evil as notions comes from the notions of tribal purity. What do I do that sets me apart from another tribe? Now, since we are, since the host culture is what we call a Judeo-Christian culture, we tend to accept, without examining it, a lot of the ideas of purity from early Hebraic practice. In fact, one of the earliest books in the Bible, Leviticus. Leviticus is not about how to be a good Jew. It's how to be pure in the priesthood. These are actually right, you know, regulations for people who are maintaining a degree of purity in a society that was multinational, multi-ethnic. I mean, Jerusalem is kind of the crossroads 
of the whole ancient world. So there's somebody marching in every few years, a new language, a new set of practices. So there's a tough question. If I want yeah. to have a tribal identity, what do I do? Therefore, you have good and evil in terms of the Old Testament. Evil are those things that other people do. They don't circumcise their boys. They eat pork. They can wear clothes made out of two different threads. Uh, they divorce their women. They can engage in passive male homosexuality. So there's all of these guidelines. Hey, don't do this. And we sort of accept that on a cultural level as what good and evil are. On the other hand, completely different cultural stream, the Greeks thought about evil as an absence. If, in fact, we fill the mind with a yearning spirit, positive reason will strive toward the good. So we have this notion that you educate yourself, you try to be fair, you work your way out of dilemmas. This is the good. Now, these are completely different notions. The Greek notion, which is pretty much my notion, is good equals smart, evil equals stupid, is very different than the Hebraic notion of good equals tribal identity. Unfortunately, in our culture, largely because of the Christian synthesis, we confuse these two things and they meld together. Now, I'm not one of those occultists who goes around blaming Christianity. Man, that is really old if I'm going to say, hey, it's their fault. Okay, that's good for your first six months of practice. Mm -hmm. After that, that's not even a working force anymore. So we confuse public good, uh, we confuse tribal good with this notion of what, is it, what does it mean to be good as a human being? What are virtues? And that virtues aren't easy to figure out because we live in a world that is shifting and chaotic and where there's a lot of different approaches. But evil largely can seem to be anything that just makes us uncomfortable, as well as those things that are true evil, true evil being human stupidity in all of its forms. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. Um, so, I, I like that notion uh, of, from the Greeks of evil being, um, you said it was a, an emptiness? An emptiness, an absence. Yeah. The good just hasn't come here yet. Mm -hmm. that, so, uh, so with that, would you uh, kind of relate that to, say, the black flame in a, in a way? Like, um, how, how do you tie that in? Well, this this concept that call we call the black flame, mm -hmm. um, which is an old concept that was given those particular that particular phraseology back when a young Satanist named Michael Aquino was writing letters to his mentor, Anton LaVey, in San Francisco as a symbol for the individual. I would call the black flame that process by which we become aware of our own individual existence and decide that the first good must be to enhance and maintain that existence. Right. Okay. Now, this does not mean that we necessarily need to eventually go into the kind of Ayn, Ayn Rand um, selfishness. Oh, that's a very popular way to view that. But what it does mean is that ultimately, as a being that's aware of himself, or aware of herself, aware of itself, the first thing has to be I am in charge of keeping myself here. Now, in the temple, we answer that question with an Egyptian verb, kefir, I have come into being, as the first starting point 
for ethics, the first starting point for philosophy, the first starting point for magical practice. The black flame, which of course obviously is a symbol for something that doesn't exist naturally, is an awareness that once I become aware of myself, I am no longer part of and completely dependent upon the natural order. I can't just say to the world, well, I came together for a little while and then I fell apart, which would be, for example, the ultimate right-hand path notion, the Buddhist notion that there is reoccurring eternal self. It's a, it's a very dangerous notion. Mm-hmm. It's a dangerous notion because it means that ultimately I will choose myself over my tribe. And the majority of human law, human philosophy, human practice exists to say that is the wrong choice. You must choose the tribe first. And as beautiful as that idea might be, that's also the choice that leads to all human corruption because inevitably then you'll have some human come along and say, I am your tribe, you must sacrifice for me. That's the moment where the left-hand path becomes your your path. We can look at people and say, you do not stand for all of us. No one should sacrifice themselves for you. But that's only going to happen after people have made that decision, which is, My first responsibility is to myself. That one decision, that unnatural moment, that moment that people break from that simple seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, animal existence, that moment everything else comes from. And that moment has to be enshrined. The enshrining of it will always be unpopular because the enshrining of it means I view myself in some way as elite. In some way, I am just better than if I'm not here. I choose existence over non-existence, consciousness over divine mindlessness. Uh, Really well said. I like that. (laughs) Um, so that was that was all the questions that I had for you today. Um, is there anything that you would like to say to our listeners, uh, either regarding uh, some of the work that you're doing or um, anything about the, the conference? There are a couple of things that I, that I would like to say just kind of generally. Sure. Um, I think the thing that looks the oddest about left-hand path philosophy that stands out really strangely is the notion of magic. Because everything I just said, choosing your own existence as primary, obviously the most rational, scientific person in the world could do that. And in fact, many have. There are a lot of great thinkers that start out with that notion. Magic is the thing that stands out as, well, that's just weird. What the hell's wrong with you people? (laughs) Now, first off, let's begin with the obvious. Most of our magic doesn't work. Most of the spells we do don't produce the result we would like to think they would produce, at least in the early part of our practice. The reason you need magic is twofold. One, magic is the easiest way to verify, to personally know that what's going on in your subjective universe has an effect that you can, in fact, change things. You can make things that are extremely unlikely or seemingly impossible into existence. Second thing, and this is the toughest part, this is what separates the left-hand path practitioner from the New Age goofball. What the the real purpose of magic is self-improvement. If I'm going to change something in the world, and I think I'm the most important thing in the world, I am what needs to change. So, yeah, at the beginning of your career, you can be in the most cases human. You're struggling with some t- something big time, like 
just getting rent money some months. You know, man, I have done uh, early on spells to, oh, my God, the rent's due, you know, tomorrow night, and I've got nothing. Right. And since there's a lot of passion involved, the spells would work. Mm-hmm. Taught me a lot about how magic works. I've never uttered a spell and had money fall out of the sky. <laughs> but I certainly have done a spell and then had job opportunities come my way. Sometimes, and here's the hard part when you're beginning as a magician, understanding that it's an opportunity, because it may not look like that when it shows up. Mm-hmm. But the ultimate practice is not, how do I change the world in little dribs and drabs when I have such great need, but cultivating a need for self-improvement, and then... Once you are good at magic, using it on yourself for initiation. Most people never make that leap. They can learn to do spells to make their life better. Well, if they're pretty good at that, they'll reach a stable point that they don't need that stuff much anymore. And they'll start to think, hey, my magic doesn't work anymore, or that's really silly. I would have got all these things with hard work anyway. Maybe so. Or... They make a leap saying, hey, my magic worked then because my need was strong. If my need were to be a better human, and of course you have to define better in your own terms, not in society's terms. If that were my strong need, and I needed that just as much as two years ago I needed my rent money, or three years ago I needed to cast a spell so my friend got out of the hospital, if I had that same need for self-improvement, then I could really become something. That's what it means in realistic ways to become a god. Not in the sense of watching bewitched that someday I'll twitch my nose and something will happen. I've in some way worked on myself that not only do I see myself as separate from the natural order, but I've come to see myself as a fact in the universe that I have become permanent like the stars. And so magic is essential in our practice, and it's the hardest part. For some people, they're drawn to the practice thinking, oh, magic will get me everything. And they find out really damn quick that it won't. Or they avoid the practice because as good, rational, scientific humans, they think, oh, magic doesn't work. You've got to trend, you have to watch out for either of those extremes and find this middle path and the only thing that will get you there is that desire to try and if you have the desire to try you'll even find the right teachers and resources oftentimes in the most unexpected of places maybe even watching Geraldo Rivera one night <laughs> well, those are really Really inspiring words. Thank you, Don. Thank you so much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this, and I'm looking forward um, to seeing you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so glad you're having this, the big uh, celebration around April 30th, yeah. and feel free to mention that that is, of course, my birthday. Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Justin. All right. Thank you, Don. And, uh, and if you, you get hold of me for anything else, you, you've got my number, you've got my email. Yep. Let's stay in touch. All right. Thank you, Don. And to everyone else, um, remember to grab your tickets uh, for Flambeau Noir, book your rooms. Uh, you can find us on Facebook or at flambeaunoir.com. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>